The events of 1961 to 1963 had considerable effect on the Soviet Navy. The significance of the Navy within the armed forces was enhanced, for naval forces could help to counter the US Navy's Polaris submarines, could help to redress the missile gap that had in fact existed in favour of the United States, and might make future incursions into the Third World more successful. With respect for shipbuilding uh, programs, the construction of Kaida class cruisers was halted after only four units built. Plans for a larger Shadrock armed ship for the anti-carrier role was abandoned. The anti-carrier effort would be left mainly to aircraft and submarines armed with cruise missiles. The ca uh, kinders were replaced on the building ways at the Zanov shipyard in Leningrad by the interim Cresta 1 class, which has one fourth of the Kinder's missile load. However, the Cresta 1 has an improved anti-aircraft and helicopter capabilities. And only four of these ships were built. Uh, the matured Cresta 2 design appeared. The Cresta 2 is an anti-submarine ship with long-range anti-submarine warfare missiles, replacing the Shadrock's anti-ship missiles. Interesting. Interesting. That, of course, is Norman Palmer. And that is the guiding point I have used for a lot of this work, I have to admit. I am shamelessly using Norman Palmer as the base point of my much of my discussion. Because, for me, he was the best at the time. There are others who have come later, who have made significant inroads and discussions. And they are certainly very capable and very good. But Palmer was the one who was at the time. I knew what he was talking about then. However, saying that, I based a lot of my discussion on him, and a lot of my ideas on him, but I don't agree with him or everything. You see, there is a problem for the Soviet Navy in the 1960s. Khrushchev had come to power. Khrushchev had got rid of Stalin's capital ship and carrier building program, even though he secretly wanted carriers to match up with the West. But they couldn't afford it. He had wanted all these status things going on, but he hadn't been able to afford it, is what he says. And then he starts putting missiles on Cuba. Now, we all know what that leads to. We all know the reality of that situation, of the very real potential of nuclear war that comes out of that particular period of the Cold War. And yet, and yet the most significant thing that comes out of it probably is Khrushchev being weakened. We don't even really see it happen. It isn't a big thing. He isn't a fall from grace with bloodshed. No, He is a drop in power. And at that point, they stop building the Kinder class. When it's realised. And they start on the Cresters. Now, someone's already chatted away on comments on the Kinder class, pointing out, you know. Oh, the salvos of the missiles were limited by how many they could control. They were. And... There is a debate over that. There is a debate over that, because it was theorised and planned to be four salvo, uh, two salvos of eight. But it was found in practice to be four salvos of four. They could fire four missiles at a time and control them. They planned for it to be two salvos of 
8. It became 4 salvos of 4 because of the control systems. And this feeds into the next class and what they're deciding because when they go with the Cresters, well, if you can only f control four missiles, you might as well only be able to launch four missiles. And that's why I left that out of that video. But also, they have another problem coming up. They've got the Kenders, they have the Cresters, they have the Svaldovs in service, the Shapayevs in service. They have all those vessels in service, and yet they've just realized the area they thought was their strongest area, the submarines, was not. A big part of the Cuban Missile Crisis is the fact that there is a huge underwater shadow war going on around both task forces at that time. Yes, American naval aircraft pull some absolutely outrageously cool stunts, but also pretty dangerous from the point of view of what they might have tipped off, but it was necessary to try sort of deterrence. One of the things, if, it, you do, if you do it right, it's good deterrence. If you do it wrong, you started a war. <sighs> it's a fine, fine line to walk. And the trouble is, if you don't walk it, then you won't have deterrence. But the thing is, Khrushchev had been the one who'd stopped the carriers and the battleships and the other thing, the major projects of Stalin. And now he's weakened. And now the man he'd appointed to replace Kuznetsov the man he'd appointed with the aim of stopping those construction programs is strengthened. The Navy is strengthened. You've weakened the Navy. You've weakened the Navy to the, which, the point to which they could get boxed around because they didn't have any means of deterring it. Now, Khrushchev hasn't fallen from power. He's just reduced his power. So you can't move quickly. But you can start to change the conversation. First of all, you have to show the weakness you have. Okay, we need anti-submarine warfare capabilities. Alright. And you migrate the Kinder design to the Cresta 2 design. Via the Cresta 1. And the main difference, the main difference is not the missile systems. They come in in the Cresta 2. The main difference between a Cresta and a Kinder is the helicopter, the hangar, the landing platform, the placement. Yes, they also have more anti-aircraft missiles, which is useful, and a better missile, which is even more useful. But what do they really give the Soviet Navy? They start to make the point that if you want a blue water fleet, you need aviation facilities. You need long range anti air firepower and you need anti submarine warfare capability that's organic to the fleet, not just dependent upon land based aviation. It's a strange thing to think about because the amount of times you'll read it and uh, look at the history and you'll look at some description of the history and they're going, you know, the Russians are making a big thing about eschewing carriers. Sometimes I look at the, at the historians who write that and go, have you never heard of the saying of they doth protest too much? The bigger the case you make, you don't need a carrier the more likely you are, you actually know you do need one. You're trying to make up for the lack of capabilities with other things. They're trying to build small ships which can punch above their weight. Oh, 
Good lord, which modern navy does that sound like? Which modern entire defence philosophy does that sound like? Punching above their weight. Oh yes, Britain. <sighs> so these are what they'd started with. They'd started with all these ambitious plans that they could be used to take on convoys and ports and carrier battle groups by launching salvos of eight missiles. Then they'd been unable to control them. Their systems hadn't allowed them to control more than four at a time. Usually two from each launcher. They tried all sorts of experiments with the four of them. But it wasn't working. And at that point, that's when you start to think, well, what am I using this space for? What am I using this space for? I've got 76mm guns aft. I've got a single anti-air missile, surface-to-air missile launcher forward. I've got my anti-submarine rockets. I've got my torpedoes, which, by the time the Crestors come in, actually do are able to engage anti-engage uh, submarines. The first generation that they are fielding in the 1960s kind of are like the Mark 14 torpedo. They're built with a lot of capability, but when you start to read between the lines, you go, "Oh, it was that bad." Again, I start with a simple policy that I do not trust 90% of what they publish at the time. And the 10% I do trust is usually stuff where I trust that they are not trying to tell me the truth. Because the Soviet Union is all about the politics, it's all about the propaganda, it's all about perception. And it's all about managing the image. Which is fine. That's their first line of national security. Managing the image. One of the things I do realise I'm going to get quite a lot of uh, comments from people in these videos which are going, oh, they're communists, they're evil, and... I'm not a fan of communism. It's really not my idea of politics. But there again, I'm not a fan of any ideolo any political ideology which rules. <laughs> I don't like ideologies as a rule. I like pragmatic, to make it, taking whichever solution works best for the scenario and going for it. But the fact is... There is one thing about communism which is fairly honest and open that everything is subordinate to the political aim. And that guides a lot of the strategy and a lot of the thinking of the Soviet Navy's designs and developments. However, it is only guiding it within the limits of that is how Gorshkov has to present it to make it unassailable. The fact that the kinders change quite so much as they evolve with the four classes shows that they were never going to be the final design. They were a starting point, as were the Cresta ones. They are a starting point. They are about developing technology, about developing capabilities. That's another reason not to build them the same size you built the Svaldovs. If you look at the Royal Navy, when they were developing the 6-inch gun, when they were developing the things they wanted to do, they built small cruisers. Once they were happy with the 6-inch turrets and they had the nice triple turret, whew, hello town class, hello crown colonies. Hello. It makes sense. It's an iterative approach to design. And if we look at some of the modern navies which are building up now, China, they have a, followed a very similar policy of an iterative approach to design. Again, 
in previous videos, I have commented and discussed on the conservative nature of naval procurement, and for obvious reasons. You don't want to take a risk which gets your country destroyed. So you make minimal changes between designs. So it's based on something which works with a couple of few things which you don't know. It's a good approach to make. It's a sensible approach. It's a very safe approach to make. And again, it's how you can change things up. And if you go back to the Royal Navy and the Dreadnought race, between every evolution of Dreadnoughts, there is usually no more than one or two changes in the fundamental design from the previous generation. Gun caliber's gone up from 13.5 to 15 inches. Cool. Speed's gone up. Cool. Everything else is pretty much the same. Yep. We haven't put the secondary armament in turrets. We haven't done... Or any, we haven't changed to a triple turret. Nothing else has really been changed. Maximum you'll find is three changes. Why? Because again... It is a safe way to d develop and evolve. It's taking a calculated risk, not taking so much risk, you're throwing the baby away with the bath water. And I hope YouTube doesn't mind that little allegation. allegory. This is what we're talking about, therefore when we are looking at these ships, when we are looking at these things that the Soviet Navy is developing in the 1960s, do not think of them as a finished product. Think of them as steps on a path to what is coming. And I'm going to expand this up to show this. So, the Kinders start at 4,600 tons in standard. 5,700 tons in full load. Crestus, 6,150 tons in standard, so 7,500 tons full load. The Cresta 2s, 6,200 tons in standard, 7,700 tons full load. Now, I would not say the Cresta 2s are the finished model either, because if you look, they still have changes and developments in them as well. But they're getting closer to it, and so they build more. You get four Kinders, four Crestas, ten Cresta 2s. Again, if you look at them, their length is slowly increasing. It goes from 143 meters on the Kinders to 148.5 meters on the water. 143 meters overall on the Kinders, 155 meters overall on the Cresters, and 158.5 meters overall on the Crestus twos. There is a length thing going up. These are growing into cruisers. They settled on the speed. 34 knots. They've settled on the turbines, the, the shaft horsepower. They have got, once they get into Cresters, they've got all pretty much the same. They've got the same beam, 17.1 meters. The Cresta 2 actually has a draft of 6.3 meters, which is in the middle. The Cresta itself originally had a larger draft. Now, the big difference starts to come down when you look at the range. 2,400 nautical miles at 32 knots. 2,000 nautical miles at 32 knots for the Kinders. The Crestus is listed at 34 knots, so 1,600 nautical miles. But honestly, I can't imagine that at 32 knots, which is still going to be using a huge amount of fuel, that that's going to increase by 800 nautical miles, the difference between the two knots. It would also seem quite obvious that 7,000 nautical miles at 14 knots for the Kinder, 7,000 nautical miles, 14 knots for the Cresta, and 10,500 nautical miles at 14 knots for the Cresta 2 is again a big improvement. And again, it's talking about the Cresta 2 having a range of operation. Now, the main difference for the Crestas is, of course, they carry more anti aircraft weapons. The Cresta 4 goes up to two twin SAN-1 anti-air launchers. That's the same system as was in the Kinder, but they've got two rather than one, and they've got 44 missiles. Cresta 2, 
Well, that has two twin SAN-3 anti-air launchers with 72 missiles. Cresta has Shadrock anti-ship missiles. If we look at the Cresta 2, that has SN-14 Silex. Two quad launchers, eight missiles. Guns, pretty much the same. Well, this Admiral Dozard starts off with the four multi-barreled um, 30 millimeter uh, guns, and those are what become the core for the Cresta II. Still having their, they've got 57 millimeter though for the Cresta and the Cresta II. This is a drop down from the 76 millimeters on the Kinders. So the guns have become more about their anti-aircraft capability. 76mm is a more general purpose weapon, the 57mm is viewed as more of an air defence weapon. And again, the big difference. Cresta has the same hull mounted sonar as the Kinder. The Cresta 2 has the new Bullnose, medium frequency hull mounted sonar. And both of them carry hormones. Ah, oh, lovely. The K-25s. Nice helicopters. So, this is the differential. This is the evolution we have going on in front of us. And you can see there are certain things which have stayed the same the whole way through. And there are things which slowly change. They make a few changes to get to the Crestus from the Kinder. And then they make a few more changes to get to the Cresta 2 from the Cresta. But even those changes are to an extent I put this politely are to an extent staggered. That you sometimes even within the class. It's even from individual ships in a four ship class there are evolutions going on before you get to what's built for the Cresta 2 to check it out, to test its working. And you'll see this in the differencing of their design. And this is again from Polmar's book. As you can see, the Silex launchers, which are indicated at number 5 on the Cresta 2 drawing, which is at the bottom of the screen, they are a big block. But they're also fixed in place. Whereas... The Shadrock launchers, they have to angle themselves up to fire. But again, this is starting off a position which you will then see in Udloys and various other ships of the Soviet development of this shaping, of these wing missile positions around the bridge, which do make them look kind of menacing. They are quite a good approach to making these ships look menacing. Because let's be honest... Nothing says scary like, look at me, I have two quad massive launchers of massive missiles next to me. You also notice that the 57mm are on the waist. They are just aft of the quintuple torpedo launchers, but they're on the waist. They're no longer on the centre line. They're on the wing, uh, they're on the way. Uh, they're at the waist position on the wings, not on the centre line. The missile launchers, the service to missile launchers, are now in those positions. As is the helicopter hangar. Now what I would also say is interesting, is that on the Cresta 2, you have an overhang back here. But at no point does it seem that they actually get a towed array sonar. So, you have a development of a space which would be, presumably, for a towed array sonar. There are towed array sonar starting to appear at this time period, but they don't fit it. Again, it's about that evolution going on. It's about a very conservative approach. First you build the space, then you build the uh, thing that goes in the space. Then you fit the thing that goes in the space to something else, which you also use as a hazard space. Because now you've got the space, you now need to think about what to do with it. It's not exactly the quickest process known to mankind, but it tends to be a nice, safe way of producing things when you're in a scenario where if you get it wrong, whilst 
The more senior you are, you do get some safety from losing your head. At a certain point after Khrushchev, it no longer becomes acceptable for you to kill the person who loses the power struggles for leadership in the Soviet Union. Uh, instead, they get retired off to go to a nice dacia and not move. It's a far nicer way of doing things. However, if you are lower down the totem pole and not publicly known, life is nowhere near so safe. You've got to love an ideology, haven't you? Anyway. These are the Crestus, the four of them. Vladivostok, Vissa, Amundrozod, Amundrozova, and Sevastopol. Which, if I remember correctly, that's number one built. Then it goes two, three, four. But I just like the way the pictures looked in that formation. They have interesting careers. They do pretty random stuff. Um, Admiral Zazula. She is known for having, uh, during testing, covering 15,615 nautical miles in 995 running hours. During testing. I don't think that was continuous, but that's what she did to test her out. She's then formed parts of the Naval Parade in honor of the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution. And in January 1968, she was attached to the 120th Missile Ship Brigade of the Northern Fleet, based at Silver Musk. I'm not a big fan of organizing ships into missile ship brigades. I would call them flotillas or squadrons, but I can understand why the Russians go the way they do. She remained part of that till October 1986. While serving the brigade, she was awarded the Navy Prize for Air Defense and achieved the first launch of a P-35 missile in October 1968. Which is pretty much while she's part of the brigade, uh, not quite early on in her career. Uh, through 1968 to 1969, she was sent on exercises to the Mediterranean Sea uh, to operate with the Egyptian Armed Forces and then went sailing around the Atlantic Ocean, taking part in Oakham 70. She returned to Leningrad for repairs and modernization in November 1971, re entered service in 1974. And in 75, went off to operate in the Mediterranean Atlantic with Admiral Ishkov. Mm -hmm. During this operation, a K-25 helicopter crashed and a single fatality. In 1978, she was renamed to Large Rocket Ship. Mm -hmm. Now, that is what is listed as by some. However, large rocket ship is one translation. Palmer puts forward that RKR, or Raketni Kreiser, which is spelled K-R-E-Y-S-E-R, Kreiser, stands for Missile Cruiser. Which is... I would say probably quite right, probably there on the money. <sighs> then she joined Admiral Markov in to monitor NATO exercises in Northern uh, Northern Wedding. I, again, why NATO? Some of the exercise names. Exercise. We are going to exercise Northern Wedding. Okay. Please, I realize you have a random name generator for exercises. But please, whoever came up with that one and allowed that one through the random name generator, can they go to a calm, quiet place and be kept away from the name generator forever? I'm hoping they are no longer anything to do with name generator, seeing that was that was in 1978. But on the outside chance 
that they were a newbie. That they were a newbie, which could happen. That's only 46 years ago. And if they joined the services when they were in their 20s, they could still be round as a civilian assistant somewhere in the Department of Defense. In which case, can we please keep them away from the name generator? Just a small request. And then she took part in Atlantica 84, which was the Soviet equivalent exercise that year. Eh, fun times. During modernization, uh, well, no, 1984, so it must have been a couple of years later. But that's the next big thing on her, my list of things. And I think Northern Wedding was in 78. So six years later. I love my notes sometimes. Uh, after modernization, she is assigned to the Baltic Fleet and joined the 12th Missile Ship Division in May 1982. In 1994, though, she's decommissioned and broken up in Baltic in 1995. For some reason, I can't think what happens. But I also find it interesting that the ship was being modernized and upgraded in 1992. Because, to me, that sounds like a heavily worked ship. And if we go through the rest of her class, I'm using an example of her class. That is a really worked ship. At that point, it probably would be more sensible to be... Um, flogging her off to someone, rather than trying to keep her in service. And speaking of comparisons, again, this is... Someone has already commented this. Do they, are they the equivalent? Are these ships the equivalent of the Deutschland class? Well, the Cresters are a little less similar, because the Kinders look quite obviously because you have the missile launcher instead of the big 11-inch guns. So they do look sort of like it on that policy. And it is sort of getting that way. But in to an extent with the Cresters, the anti-ship missiles have, the surface attack missiles have gone back to being almost sort of the secondaries. And the primaries now are your two anti-air missile launchers. And, to be honest, if you want to ask what a ship is about, what its role is going to be, what its, what its primary functions are, look at what it places in it, positions of preeminence in terms of its weaponry. Which goes fore and aft. Which is big and centerline. I'd also point out, though, that there is definitely some similarities of construction going through in terms of mass design going on here. And it's for similar reasons. You want to get things up as high as you can, stable as they are. And by the way, I, was, I did have a version of this slide which had the Type 45 destroyer on there as well, <laughs> for a similar point. But basically, you're trying to maximize your ability to see around the curvature of the Earth from your ship. You need a mass as high as you can go which can also carry the weight of the equipment you want to put up there. You end up with a pyramid style structure. It doesn't hurt though that the uh, Soviets were still using shipyards which were building using captured German machine plant and had, how do I put this, had more than a little infusion of German naval architecture technology brought back with them. Not only had they had it prior to World War II, they had a fair amount of it brought back with them after World War II. Remember those race for rocket scientists? The Soviet Union wasn't just interested in capturing rocket scientists. They went for everyone they could get from Germany. And entire families of everyone who they could disappear. <sighs> Doesn't necessarily get you the best designs, though. I would say this: for, uh, there are lots of ways when you're dealing with ship design, where a very good naval architect can make a decision seem totally reasonable and could argue it against anyone as being the best choice, and yet give you something which is an absolute dud. Usually, they do that by just giving you what you ask for, rather than explaining how the problems or what the problems are with it. 
Mm -hmm. So, the Metal Anti-Ship Complex. Mm -hmm. Well, it's mainly an anti-submarine weapon, but it does evolve. So, the original, 60R original version, was armed with a 5 kiloton nuclear depth charge. So, I think that would probably cause an issue for a submarine. And there was also the 70R, which was the original version armed with an A2, A AT-2U ASW torpedo. And then they sort of started upgrading. Uh, the cruiser version of the missile using the guidance system from the SAN-3 missile and the KT-106 launcher uses an AT-1 torpedo. It just gets more and more fun as you go on. So, specifications. Near enough 4 tons, let's be honest. 3,930 kilograms is near enough 4 tons. Length 7.2 meters. That's for the 85R missile. Uh, warhead, various anti-submarine torpedoes on nuclear depth charges. Um, later, multi-purpose torpedoes and um, 185 kilogram shaped charge warhead against ships. Solid fuel rocket for the propellant. Operational range, 10 to 90 kilometers for anti-ship, 5 to 50 kilometers for anti-submarine. Maximum depth, uh, 20 to 500 meters. Maximum speed, Mach 0.5. And it's a uh, Radio command via helicopter or other external guidance plus infrared seeker for the missile system uh, for the anti ship missile. Now, Cresta 2s, Karas, Vesniks 1 and 2, Udloys, and Kirovs all start mounted these weapons. This is the next generation of what you're building a ship around. And again, The missiles of this period are not particularly, how do I put this, complicated. They have minimal guidance, they have basically a large rocket engine, and they have a payload. It's not particularly complicated. It's fairly brutal. But it works. It does work. And for the Cresta 2s, it was exactly what they needed to set themselves apart and start off this mantra that the Soviet ships, all their large ships, are just anti uh, for anti-submarine warfare. Because again, that's a rather nice thing for NATO and various others to start writing them as it. It's a very easy way to write off a surface ship in terms of a political debate if you can write it off as just being a large anti-submarine warfare vessel. Oh yes, that's just a, that's just an anti-submarine warfare ship. So no, we don't need to put any more funding into ship defence or worry about them at all from a ship uh, from a car uh, attacking a carrier perspective. We can use that money for um, more troops on the <coughs> well, more troops in Germany and Central Europe and deal that front. We can we can put more troops there. We don't need to worry about those ships. Especially the torpedo versions, I have to admit, whilst hmm, possibly being limited in terms of their capability against surface ships, the idea of being able to heft a torpedo into the range of a task group and launching it in, I have a feeling that would cause quite a lot of disruption. It would cause quite a lot of disruption. Against aerial threats, these ships carried their SAN-3 surface to air missiles. They carried their 57mm L80E dual-purpose guns, the two twin mountings, and the four 30mm AK-630 close-in weapon systems. They have a range of radars. Now, Kronstadt and Admiral Iskov are particularly interesting examples of the class. 
Mainly, they're interesting because of what they don't do. And Kronstadt, I'll just focus on what she does in the 1970s. She's assigned to the 120th Missile Ship Brigade of the Northern Fleet on the 9th of March 1970, under the command of Captain Lev Yenomokov. Uh, Yevdokimov. Yevdokimov. After completing tests, she was relocated from the Baltic Fleet to the main use of the Black Sea Fleet at Sevastopol. From basically May to July 1971, she cruises over Musk, the main base of the Northern Fleet, and then operating Mediterranean Fleet along the way. Between September and October that year, she, op uh, she observes and monitors NATO exercise Iron Knight. In 1972, she participated in the rescue of the Soviet submarine K-19 in the North Atlantic, uh, working alongside Leningrad, which of course was, well, a Moscova class helicopter carrier, uh, the Alexander Nevesky, another cruiser, and the Vitsan Mondrozod of the previous class, and the submarine tender Magma Gunners, Guard ship uh, SB-38 and rescue ship Kapate. During the operation, her air group, which was led by uh, VG Semenkin, distinguished itself and the ship was given a red banner by the executive committee of the city committee of the Communist Party of Sochi as thank you for their service. Let's put it this way. I always loved the fact in the Soviet Union they just have committees for everything and everything has multiple committees. It's a great way of ensuring you do are not personally culpable for anything by having every decision being made by a committee. Well, it was the best decision the committee could make based on the information the committee had available. I am not personally responsible for this. No, it's not me. It was the committee. We are all share the blame. By 13 December, the decree of the Presidium of the Soviet Armed Forces, she received a Jubilee Badge of Honor on the 50th anniversary of the Communist Party's Central Committee. Please note, she's getting all these awards just from committees. On the next day, the cruiser's Commonsol organization received a commemorative red banner from the Commonsol Central Committee, and the ship was added to the Northern Fleet Military Council's Book of Honor. So, what can we take from that? She did well. She did really well. But, she does so well they're making a very big fuss over it, so obviously they are covering up something, would be my mind. Because... Any time anyone makes a very big public fuss or something in a totalitarian regime, they are either trying to make up for something and turn and create heroes to cover a loss, or they are trying to create a story to draw you away from another story. And that's a lot of effort. She also then went in and participated in Exercise Laguna in 1973, which was searching for NATO submarines in the North Atlantic. She did this alongside her sister, Anne Monakimov, and uh, some other vessels of an anti-submarine warfare group. They thought they detected a potential NATO submarine in the Norwegian Sea, uh, which was tracked until it reached Norwegian territorial waters. During the 19 days of the exercise, she managed to steam mm, near enough 6,700 nautical miles. In June that year, Kronstadt made the first SSN-14 launch, the Silex or metal system, in the Northern Fleet area. And this was assessed as good. Which I'm sort of surprised at because... How do I put this? When they had done quite as much effort as they had to publicize that event and make it as visible as they could, assessing it as or just as good rather than excellent would suggest to me that there had been a lot of issues go wrong. Or that the person in charge of assessing the operation was a master of understatement and felt that good 
would be perfect to set the tone right for the public perceptions. I'm not sure. But certainly it's one of the two. Anyway, here is the more is interesting thing. What the Russians call Storm, and what NATO calls Goblet. I would just like to say something. Just a small thing. I do sometimes think NATO, when giving Russia name for thing, uh, names for Russian things, does pick a name which is a little bit on the side of we're going to be rude about you. Not so much that, you, in that anyone can really take massive offence, but enough that you're calling an anti-aircraft missile goblet. Okay. Carried in pairs on rotating twin launchers. Speed, Mach 2 to 3. Length, 6,100 millimetres. Roughly 20 feet. Mass, 1,844 kilograms. That's, again, not that far off two tons, if we're thinking about it. So, let's be honest, these are not exactly light things. Warhead, 80 kilograms. Okay. That's kind of a small warhead for that size of weapon. Um, but actually makes point at this time, that is kind of normal. Effective... Altitude and range is sort of 125,000 meters, so theoretically up to really 80,000 feet. Uh, engagement range, again, effective engagement range is uh, 3 to 30 kilometers for the first generation. Uh, the next generation sort of gives a 55 kilometer range. Radio command guidance. And radars often used the emblem included headlights for fire control and top sail for search radar. So if we go back, we can actually look at these ships and we can work out, hmm, yeah, when are they planning for this system? When are they planning for this new missile system to go in? And we can think about that because we can look at the radars. Ooh, headlights. Mm-hmm. They come in with the Crest of Twos. It's an iterative process. It's a development going on. Now, again, I will say there is some sort of interesting things going on because... You have a discussions on how many of those missiles they carry. And some people say this number, some people say that number. Again, I'm going with Palmer's. So, next two ships. The Admiral Makarov and the Admiral Makimov. Now, Makimov we've already mentioned, so let's talk about Mak uh, Makarov. Makarov... Mm, has a fun career, really. She was relocated in the 1970s to uh, Baltisk in preparation for a voyage to Northern Fleet. Now, she had been built in the Zananov shipyard and she basically spent most of her time there in the early 1970s. So it's sort of 1972 we're talking about. While she's there, and she's been moved there for very specific reasons, she's visited by the Defence Minister, Andrei Greco, and, and more importantly, Sergei Goshkov, the Admiral of the Fleet of the Soviet Union. They come to visit their new ship. They come to see where they are in the process of development. Now, if you are looking at the Admiral Makarov's design and the picture there, you will notice something looks very interesting about that hangar. It really does look kind of interesting about that hangar, doesn't it? Now, you're probably going, 
why is that roof sticking up? Why are those doors shaped like that? What is going on there, Alex? Well, let me explain with the help of a... Well, an image I'm not quite sure where I got it from, but I know it's accurate. I've just picked it up over the years. This is the hangar arrangement on a Cresta 2. You'll notice the flight deck is raised up. As mentioned earlier, the flight deck is raised up, which presumably could be used as space for a Todoray Sonar. But of course, they don't fit a Todoray Sonar, so it's raised up. But there's nothing really using that space. But they've kept the hangar in, broadly speaking, the same profile and position as it is on the Cresta 1. Instead of raising the hangar up, which would have caused them to have to raise up the aft surface-to-air missile system and change around some of the features of that, they have instead fitted it with a roof which pops up, doors which open, and a system whereby the helicopter is brought down in and tucked down below flight deck level. The amount of effort you can go to to try and not make design changes is, again, interesting. But again, I feel this is not just... It, it's a very innovative idea. I do accept that. It's a very ingenious solution to a problem which is entirely created because no one wanted to change design too much. And again, this is the point I was making about naval architects. If they really want to cause you trouble... They give you what you ask for. Basically, uh, this design is also used on the Udaloy class. Even more fun. And so, the roof would retract, ramp raises up, Occasionally lowers the hangar, but at the uh, at the plane. So basically, at the helicopter. So basically, you see this floor here goes up, helicopter goes on, and then it goes down. A whole load of weight and systems and technology which can go wrong sitting at your rear. It's just it's just brilliant when you could just raise the hangar up, and you could have just raised the missile up. And then you've had more space in your ship and might have actually been able to fit that Toad Ray Sonar. But again, it to me it highlights the fact that there is a lot of innovation going on in the Soviet Navy. But it's a lot of innovation to keep things iterative. Because that's the safe approach to development. And so we have to not think of ships necessarily as representing a finished point or a point at which we can go oh, this shows exactly what the Soviet Navy want to build really it does but it's a step along the line it shows you what they're emphasizing in this design and what they're thinking at this point but it doesn't necessarily show you the finished result of what they want it shows you what they're aiming for perhaps if you can look back at previous ships and see where it's going its progression but you really can't be sure until you see what the next ship looks like, what it was aiming for. Ah, the AK-630. Now, this is an interesting system. It really is. It's been around for a long time. It's been produced since 1972. And it's first design was in it was started in 1963 the first operational prototype was completed in 1964 trials on the system and including radar controls etc actually continued until 1976 and that's when the system was accepted for service however they then deployed it on ships and unsurprisingly it broke a lot as problems that had not appeared in the trial scenario were exposed in its application, which is code for things we never thought of testing because we never asked the people who might know what was testing actually went wrong. And 
And so they corrected this, and the new system that's eventually fitted is known as the AK630M. Now, it's still around in various versions to this day, and its effective firing range is probably 4,000 meters. Its rate of fire is, well, for the M variant, is um, was four to five thousand rounds a minute. But there is a small issue with this. They can get through their rounds very, very quickly. They can get through the amount they carry very, very quickly. So you need to be carrying quite a large stockpile of ammunition to keep that thing fed. Or it's going to run out incredibly quickly. But hey, it has a traverse of... Well, it can do plus, 180 degree, plus or minus 180 degrees in roughly 80 seconds on the AK-630M2. 70 seconds was what their plan was for... Um, the previous generation. I'm never quite sure I agree with those ones. They, it's basically, it's 70 degrees a second, or 80 degrees a second, and I think from my own occasionally watching them, I'd say the figure's probably closer to 60, but videos have video footage, and they're not quite full degrees, so it's again, it's an estimation, and it's still blooming fast. And, of course, they, well, the original variant could go up to 88 degrees, or minus 12. The latest variant can do up to 90 degrees, or minus 25. So that's quite a good field of fire. And, middle World War II, that would have been a very useful thing to have. Very, very useful thing to have. Yes, it's firing a 30mm round, but it would have been a very useful thing to have in World War II. Very, very useful one to have. So. Ah, uh, Marshal Voshlov. Mm hmm. Another ship with an interesting career. She was the first shipment of the class completed with the MR-123 Vimpel fire control radar for the AK-630s. The first four ships didn't receive it. She was commissioned in September 1973 under the command of Captain Second Rank Alexander Kosov. Now, again, she's another ship which gets sent to Baltisk to be checked over and then she decides to prepare for its voyage to Vladivostok and sort of it's heading on it's getting ready and again goes to Vladivostok while going through the English Channel for some reason it's shadowed by the Royal Navy heavily and they extensively photograph her ah this is her in roughly 1990. And it becomes a small obsession of the Royal Navy to keep photographing this ship wherever it goes around the world. This was the first time a Cresta 2 cruiser had been spotted in western waters close enough that rather than international waters that they could get really close and inspect it and get some really good pictures of it. That mattered. During the voyage it visited Port Louis in Mauritius it was accompanied by the tanker Grozny. G R O S O Z N Y, single Y. Uh, between the 2nd and 8th of March 1974, then Malabo, and Equatorial Guinea, and then Berbera, Somalia, between the 3rd and 7th of April. When it reached the Far East, it's assigned to the 201st Anti Submarine Warfare Brigade of the fleet's 10th Operational Squadron. Again, the level of complexity of command structures going on here. I keep expecting them to say more committees. 
every time I read my notes, I keep going, where's the London, and that, where's the next committee going to be? It's it's the thing which the Soviets have. They are a, they are really, really many, many layers of organisation. You will see. This is the thing. There are two things you can tell whenever you're uh, looking at the Soviet Navy. One, people, if they're around for any long time, will suddenly have a sea of gold and brass and silver on their chest. They will have an absolute sea of it. Secondly, they will have a command structure which is so many layers and so many things going off and off and off, you need a version of the London Tube map to figure out exactly what's going on where and who's in command of what. She then spends quite a lot of her time, even though she's technically based at uh, Zoltorog on the Sea of Japan, operating in Indian Ocean. Um, goes back to Vladivostok only for routine repair. Participated in a rescue operation for three Riga-class frigates of the Sakhalin Flotilla during severe storms in the Sea of Japan during 1977 in the winter. Uh, this storm actually damaged the stern storm launcher and the forward Volga navigation radar. And so she goes in and have those fixed. And then takes part in the Pacific Fleet Maneuvers in 1978, which were observed by the General Secretary of the Communist Party at the time, Leonid Brezhnev. And, of course, Defence Minister Dmitry Ustinov. Always nice to have the bra top brass around. Now, this is what all that hangar mess was about. All that capabilities, all those things at the back were about taking this, the Kamov K-25, which, well, I'm not really always sure if it's necessarily worth it in the first versions. Later versions certainly get very interesting. Later versions certainly get very interesting for their time. Earlier versions, well, their first hovering flight was 1963. They're introduced into service in 1972. They're produced from 1965 to 1977. The previous version, the K-20, which they'd have sort of developed from, is really interesting. It's a demonstrator. And it's displayed in the uh, Toshino Aviation Day display, as well, in 1961. It has issues in that for its flight time it requires a massive amount of maintenance. However, anti-submarine helicopters and anti-submarine aircraft were the way forward. And so, they eventually managed to build it. And whatever it might look to our eyes, accustomed to the helicopters we have today, for the time, it was not bad. I can be equally rude about some of the Western helicopters at the time, because there were a lot which had interesting ideas. Now, the first variant, um, sometimes known as the Hormone A, but also known as the K-25 BSH, uh, was anti submarine warfare pure. It had a radar, but it's dipping sonar, has a towed magnetic anomaly detector, torpedoes, can take nuclear or conventional depth charges, all sorts of things. The aircraft. And it slowly is upgraded. Slowly. There are no current operators, but former operators include the Bulgarian Navy, the Indian Navy, the Russian Navy, the Soviet Union, well, of course the Soviet Union, um, the Syrian Navy, Ukraine, Vietnam, and Yugoslavia. Interesting one there for me is Yugoslavia. They are the most picky when it comes to aircraft. Yugoslavia really wouldn't be pushed around. 
They might have been another communist nation, but honestly, whenever they turned around and didn't like what the Soviet Union were trying to sell them, they tended to build their own. So, it shows that by the time they procure it, definitely, it is a reliable and worthwhile investment. Vasily Chapiev, Marshal Tomashenko, Admiral Isakov, and Admiral Yumashev. Now, I have to admit, I'm not giving too much detail about their careers. I'm not doing what I would do with the gun cruisers and the earlier vessels. And there is a reason for that. Some of the stuff they get up to is still kind of interesting from our perspective. But also, there is the fact that, luckily, for these ships and for our ships, they didn't have much of a war fighting career. Most of their careers were patrols, presence, deterrence missions. This is the norm. Okay? Most of a warship's life, especially now they're usually in commission rather than in ordinary, is spent wandering around the world doing the presence mission, doing the diplomatic mission, doing the status mission, being the visible signs of capability of their nation. And these were very visible signs of the capability of the nation. Let's be honest, they are festooned with massive missiles. You, there is no picture you can take of this ship unless you zoom in incredibly closely, which does not have a weapon looking at you. They look like any six-year-old's dream idea of what a warship is going to be. You give a six-year-old, anyone, and you tell them to draw a warship, it will come out festooned with guns, missile launchers, all sorts of things all over the place. Well, again, there is a point for this. And there is a point of this that's going on. Because you, as I said in the previous video, the politicians of the time, a lot of them are World War II veterans, and a lot of those veterans are using their experience to try and guide what they need to do. And therefore, you have weapons which they are familiar with, and weapons which they aren't familiar with. And then they are familiar enough, with the ones they're familiar with, that look similar to the ones they knew, they're scary enough because they know their capabilities. But they also know you're packing these weapons as well. And that gives them a point of reference to start the thinking. These weapons are very powerful. These weapons are scary. It's good psychology. psychology. It's good politics. It's good image projection. And it's actually good to do it in an iterative way, although I don't think this was not Soviet intent, because if you're replacing those older weapons, which those people have as a base of reference, with these newer weapons, you automatically, if you're a person who's familiar with those weapons which are being replaced, going, well, hang on, those were scary and capable. They're replacing those with these? They must think these are way better than those were. Sugar. That is what is part of it. It's an effect of it. It's not really an aim of the process. Mm. Now, Timoshenko is probably my favourite name for it, but mainly uh, for one of these ships, but mainly it's because this is... How do I put this politely? It's... Named for someone who really, really tried. He really tried to serve the Soviet Union as best as he could. And he actually managed to survive with Stalin. Which is a feat. It's a feat. And he never gets taken out by Stalin. So I'd say that's a pretty cool thing to actually... To have risen to the level of prompts he did, Tomashenko did, and not get taken down by Stalin, either shows that Stalin hadn't managed to do it before he died, or you were successful at keeping Stalin's... How do I put this? Uh, base urges of fear against you. Limited.
an interesting ship. So what are they in summary? Are they cruisers? Are they large anti-submarine ships? What are they? Well, why can't a cruiser not be a large anti-submarine ship? We accept the Didos, we accept all sorts of vessels as cruisers when they are anti-aircraft ships. Anti-submarine cruiser doesn't seem anything wrong. And yes, on the face of it, this ship seems to be not that well armed for anti-ship engagement. Other than, honestly, I think if you set off a nuclear depth charge anywhere near me on a ship, I would not want to be on that ship. I might well survive, depending on this uh, distance, etc. But I don't think it's going to be a pleasant experience. I, I, I really don't think. So, whilst, yes, technically anti-submarine weapons, they, they're not exactly things that I... If anyone here really would like to comment and say they wouldn't mind being on a surface ship when a nuclear depth charge goes off, be my guest, but I will probably not believe you. These ships are, again, designed with presence in mind. Yes, they're going to form part of the anti-submarine task force. Yes, they're going to form part of the force of the Soviet Navy. Yes, they're going to be command assets, yeah, commanding and leading groups. But they're also going to be the presence ships going around the world showing off their capabilities. These are what these ships are about. They are an iterative design. They're a good design. For what the Soviet Union is producing at this time, they are a good design. And they have some very interesting and nice lines. I would so have <laughs> Sorry, the stern I would have completely reorganized. I would not have a hanger with that facility. The fact that it carries on into the Udloys and is considered something of a, you know, a, a benefit and, it, you know, it's a good idea. You sit there and go, how? You know, between... Uh, you, know, you have the Kara class next. And then you have all sort of, other sort of vessels going on in terms of cruisers. The Udloys are destroyers and you you carry on this idea into these poor ships and you're going Why? Why would you do that to your ship? Why? Anyway. Good ships. They have an interesting range of radar and electronic warfare kit. Again, I'm avoiding talking about this as much in these first couple of videos because I want to talk about them especially in the third of the Soviet Navy series. So there are certain things I am keeping off because this is part of a whole wider series on the Soviet Navy I'm doing. Okay, So there are things which make it into the videos, things which don't. But the question I want to ask you today is this. Do you think that hangar design is a good idea? I know I am very dismissive of it, but I would like to hear that. I'm sure there are some reasonable arguments. Do you think it was a worthwhile thing to do? To do this to a hangar in order to, av to avoid modifying the arrangement of the after-missile launches, etc. Do you think it was sensible? Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, we've, we've got, we've got, what have we got coming up? We have tomorrow, we have the Patreon 68 Live. We have the Royal Navy and the Dual Purpose 4.7 inch gun mount. Long patrol for that will be on Saturday. So if you don't like lives, the recorded video will be coming out Saturday. And the next Soviet themed Navy uh, video will be the Soviet Navy 1939 to 65. So what I'm calling Kuznetsov to Gorshkov in my mind. And. Yeah, that is Friday's video. I hope you're going to enjoy it. Take care. Have a nice day, and thank you for watching.